Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new Record Club episode of the Jam Z Podcast, where each week one of us picks an album, or in this case, albums, for everybody to listen to so we can talk about it in an episode like this. And this week, we have elected to go with my recommended records, which are, in fact, the Beach Boys Pet Sounds and the Beatles Revolver. I am a longtime Beatles fan, as I've said on this podcast many times and have discussed. And I thought this would be an interesting exercise to do, mainly because these albums were, you know, they're obviously classic, indisputably classic records that were both released in 1966 and have deep rooted connections to one another and i thought it would be interesting to do an episode where and they're also both comparatively kind of brief records where we compare and contrast them and talk about the influence that they have and the records themselves and ultimately which album we prefer the year is 1966 and there's like three albums in this year I would say that are like represent like the most kind of transgressive and important music that was happening that would have the most lasting influence two of them are the two we're discussing today the other is Bob Dylan's Blonde on Blonde but that's kind of its own thing Um, but these two albums are particularly interesting to discuss together because what they kind of represent is a dichotomy in terms of the future of pop music at this particular juncture in history, where essentially the seeds for what pop music would become in the next 50 years are essentially being planted. And well, they've been planted actually throughout the first half of the 60s, but 1966, and with these two albums in particular, is where that explodes. And what I mean by that is where the convention that has been established for what pop music is, how pop music is recorded, like the structures of pop music, the extent to which the studio is a part of the pop music creation process. These two albums were where all of those things fundamentally shifted and exploded, in fact, in terms of like possibilities and experimentation and the actual frontiers of genre being like blown open blown wide open in fact and it all starts with a little album that came out in 1965 actually called Rubber Soul by the Beatles uh you may have heard of them uh the this, underground band this was essentially the album that I mean in the history in the canonical history of the, of the Beatles Rubber Soul is often considered the moment where the Beatles truly shifted from being uh, one of the, just one of the most popular and beloved and sort of important uh, pop bands to a truly kind of visionary experimental force in pop music that Rubber Soul I guess helped to a certain extent as well but really Rubber Soul as a full holistic album was where that shift really began to happen <coughs> but it didn't happen super dramatically Rubber Soul is a record that obviously has a lot in common with the albums that precede it, has a lot of historical precedent in the songwriting style and that sort of thing. Where it kind of differed was in the complexity of the arrangements, the kind of things that the Beatles were writing and singing about as well. I think that album is notable for having the first Beatles song that isn't about a relationship on it, which is Nowhere Man. And like, so that's kind of emblematic of what's happening at this point is the Beatles' interests and the Beatles' like... um, you know experimentation and like the things that they're doing the way they're composing songs the instrumentation they're using is getting dramatically more ambitious and because the Beatles are getting more ambitious pop music is getting more ambitious because the Beatles are the face of it at this particular point in time there are other really important bands that are also coming up in this time Rolling Stones the Kinks so much of up music as well like a lot of rock and roll and a lot of Motown influence soul music and all that sort of stuff is, is exploding at this point but the Beatles are at the forefront and why I give such a spiel about an album we're not even reviewing is because that album is the impetus for what is in my opinion the single most masterful pop album of all time which is the beach boys pet sounds it is the in as much as a single pop record can be like influential it's probably the most influential and probably the most innovative single pop record ever 
I, it's a bold claim, but I feel pretty safe in making it and I'm going to substantiate it heavily in this video. But the reason this album existed is Rubber Soul, not just in the traditional sense that, hey, the Beatles did Rubber Soul and all of a sudden like the language was shifted. And yeah, but also a man named Brian Wilson became obsessed with Rubber Soul. Brian Wilson, of course, the front man, the icon, the legendary leader of the Beach Boys, who up until this point in, in time, it should be noted, had a similar kind of trajectory as the Beatles, although the type of pop music they were doing was very different, was like surf music, was like this very specific sort of like sunny, bright sort of major key, uh, had this very sort of like 50s uh, roots that it was sort of based in, whereas what the Beatles were doing where it was rock and roll, was like heavily kind of lifting from a different sort of musical lineage. But the moment where the Beatles and the Beach Boys collided was around this time and right in the middle of the 60s, when Rubber Soul essentially changed the game for composition of pop music and composition of rock and roll. And also the kind of things that pop and rock and roll songs were written about, as I said. So anyway, Brian Wilson becomes fixated on Rubber Soul and in his words becomes determined and I love this because it's such a beautiful piece of like his history that you would think that it was fabricated, but literally outright says, I am going to make the greatest pop album of all time. That is his goal as soon as he hears Rubber Soul, because in his view, the only way to do something that matches or exceeds Rubber Soul is to make the greatest pop record of all time. And you've got to appreciate that level of affection and like a reverence that he has for his friends and the Beals who are like, you know, the same age. Um, but also like the sheer nature of competition that's fostered there as well. I think a lot of this is sensationalized in media and stuff the extent to which these two bands were competing or had a rivalry I think that and also like with the Beatles and Stones sort of thing as well I think sometimes the bands lent into that sort of thing and sometimes it was sensationalized to a certain extent definitely fair to say that between the Beatles and the Beach Boys if there was a rivalry it was absolutely a friendly one it was absolutely one of like each pushing the other to kind of like was specifically Brian Wilson uh, being pushed by John Lennon and Paul McCartney and vice versa to up their game in terms of sophistication of arrangements, in terms of like uh, classical, being able to come up with classical melodies, in terms of being able to write songs that immediately resonate with people on a level that's more emotionally complex than what pop music had been up to that point. And that's the name of the game really, is emotional complexity. That's the thing I think that defines the, the single most uh, connective thing that defines the shift in pop music was emotional complexity in songwriting and how these innovative musicians reflected that with increased complexity in the actual arrangements themselves. Deeper involvement of innovative new studio techniques. If you read about the ways in which these albums Pet Sounds and Revolver were recorded, were conceptualized. You have these amazing techniques that are being used, these ideas that no one had come up with up until this point, being used to make certain sounds sound a new way and also to create new sounds in the first place. You have the influence, another big influence. I'm sorry, I know I'm totally rambling here. I'll cur curb this off in a second. Another big influence that's important to mention for Pet Sounds in particular is. Uh, a man who unfortunately has become more infamous for uh, subsequent things. Oh no! To do, but the man is Phil Spector, and um, his influence on as we've said in the past, he really killed it. He really killed and it. And then, um, what is timely about this video, in a way that um, we absolutely could not have predicted, is that I think just yesterday, the day before we recorded this, Ronnie Spector, the front woman and singer of the Renettes, passed away. And the Renettes, of course, were the band that achieved glory under the sort of hand of Phil Spector, who innovated his production technique known as the Wall of Sound, specifically with the Renettes, and specifically in the song Be My Baby, which came out in 1963, I remember. And when that song was released, 
the production, the sound of that song, no song and no music in the history of pop up to that point sounded like that, had that level of density in, in terms of the mix. Pop music up to that point sounded two-dimensional. It sounded janky. Rock and roll sounded janky. And that was kind of the appeal of it. But all of a sudden, here comes Phil Spector to make rock music and pop music sound enormous, sound huge, sound spacious, sound layered with more than just your guitar based drums to have like the atmospherics and mix be as much of a core component of what made a song good as the instrumental performers and vocalists on the song. And the reason I bring this up is that alongside Rubber Salt, the other core influence on Brian Wilson and conceptualizing pet sounds and writing and recording this album was Phil Spector's wall of sound production approach. Not only did Brian Wilson want to write the best fucking pop songs of all time, not only did he want to craft them into a single flowing project that was the best pop record of all time, he wanted them to sound huge. He wanted them to sound enormous. He wanted them to be packed with detail with instrumentation with bells and whistles that do that didn't add act as mere like dressing but were integral to the effect of the songs and so the dna of pet sounds is in phil Spector's production approach and in the beatles songwriting and composition approach on rubber soul uh brian even said at one point that Pet Sounds is a concept album, but it's not a concept album about a theme or about a story. It is a concept album about production, about music production, and about all the possibilities as he sees it. And so while we don't want to denigrate or take away from the contributions of the other band members and the Beach Boys, it should essentially be foregrounded that this is entirely the vision of Brian Wilson with a couple of songwriting credits to people like Mike Love for some additions made to certain songs. But this is Brian's vision through and through. He's even said he considers it a solo album, uh, which is interesting considering that a lot of the songs here are not, not sung by Brian, but in fact are sung by Mike Love and by um, Carl Wilson, his brother, uh, Carl and Dennis and all that sort of stuff. Like it is a band performance, but these are Brian Wilson compositions and so deep breath <laughs> that is I, I believe really important groundwork and to discuss these songs themselves so let's talk about what pet sounds is because we talked about what the vision for pet sounds what does it actually sound like what are these songs uh, what makes these songs so lasting who wants to kick us off i've got a good entry point i think and that is that I would like to make the argument that at least from this point going forward, the first seven seconds of the opening track of Pet Sounds are the most important opening seconds of a song in the history of pop music. And it is maybe the thing that I think caught me the most off guard when I first listened to this. I probably am the person who had discovered this the most recently. I only listened to Pet Sounds in late 2020. Um, but the thing that caught me off guard is that I knew this was one of the most acclaimed uh, albums of all time. People held it in high esteem, but I had never heard it before other than, you know, singles used in movies. So I didn't pay attention to the way that the song sounded. I paid attention to the lyrics and the vocals. But what kind of blew me away is just the depth of the sound, that dreamy kind of sort of instrumental that leads into the like those seven seconds before the drum hit make this song from the get-go sound like it's cavernous it sounds fucking huge like if you listen to this with some decent headphones it's as deep as any shoegaze song you would are likely to hear and not to mention just the overall vibe of it like it captures so many elements of alternative music that wouldn't show up for 15, 20, 25 years. I mean, what is dream pop as a genre or even shoegaze or anything beyond that without an album like Pet Sounds and without the approach to sound of a song like this? And then that drum hits 
And then you are essentially experiencing what could be, I think, argued as one of not only just, you know, it's one of the best pop albums of all time. I'm not here to present a dissenting opinion, but I also just think this is genuinely one of the best written pop albums ever. Like the emotional through line of this album is, in my opinion, what really elevates everything about it is that everything here is perfectly written to be catchy everything here is perfectly written to stay in your head to be memorable uh everything's lyrical everything's perfect but it's tangibly emotional on every song you know exactly how to feel you're put into the per like the exact headspace and the depth of the sound just really immerses you in all that and that's why like wouldn't it be nice is just basically the 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 template the blueprint for music after this point which god holy shit absolutely morgan what are you, what are your thoughts on the opening of this album and, and wouldn't it be god nice damn uh well i i shit i mean it's like well first of all it's the loudest thing that anyone has ever made um <laughs> after you know the little do, 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 and the drum hits like wouldn't it be nice if we <laughs> like some yeah! some Gavin Harrison blackest eyes shit that fucking drum hill though <laughs> <laughs> like it's, it's it's fucking clown from Slipknot beating on trash cans it's so good <laughs> you're so right you're so right oh god uh, like uh I, f- this album sounds like god I want to circle back to a point uh, on here of like the the writing of, I think this is in the, the a movie that I have only seen a little bit of, but I think it's the biopic Love and Mercy, which is about Brian Wilson. Uh, and there's a scene in that where he writes, I believe it's either, wouldn't it be nice or God only knows. And he shows it to somebody and uh, they their response is, this reads like a suicide note, not a pop song. And that is that is exactly why the songs you on this see. album are so goddamn good. <laughs> you see, see, this is the thing that we have to appreciate about Brian Wilson in this period. This motherfucker was sad. This motherfucker <laughs> was really sad. Bipolar like, disorder be hitting it was, different. It was the emergence of his psychosis Yeah, was the and, writing and process for this album. The writing and recording process as well, because the thing to appreciate about the way this album was created is that... the man was working like every moment that he was not sleeping brian wilson was thinking about this album he was working on it either in his head or in reality this totally consumed him and it's difficult to even really fathom that although when you listen to it you can obviously hear how labored every detail of it is but it's almost kind of like awe inspiring in the sense that you get the picture that it's kind of a terrifying work of art in the sense that it couldn't be created if it didn't have that level of of sheer devotion and dedication and it it kind of makes listening to it kind of a bit imposing even and like comprehending it I know yeah Jacob you haven't spoken yet I want to hear from you about um obviously like I guess we're kind of moving through this record but what your general impressions of the sound of this album is like the headspace that it puts you in like yeah how do you feel when you listen to this record okay so I was 17 years old I was extremely like even though like I was getting more and more into music i had basically like kind of like i was still like rock was still my big genre but i was like kind of like expanding my territories like really like consuming pop music at the time i was getting more and more into pop music i did but i didn't have like a lot of hot takes or anything that could be considered like against the norm except for two albums wilco's yankee hotel foxtrot and the beach boys pet sounds at first, like I okay, I was into punk, I was into metal, I was into like harder rap and stuff like that. I did not want to hear this hippy dippy bullshit about this like dude like who doesn't like who's whining about Caroline. I did not want to hear about any of that, except for two songs that stuck with me, and that was Wouldn't It Be Nice and God Only Knows. This album kept following me though, because like I felt bad that I did not like this album. I, I preferred the Beatles. I preferred Odyssey and Oracle by the Zombies. Uh, I preferred like um, 
artists like those, but something about Pet Sounds just stuck with me. And every once a year, I always came back to it. And I was just like, it's not working for me, but I can see it now. Like it went from hate to respect. And then around like 2019, I'm like, okay, I think I like it now. And then one fateful day, 2020, everything fell completely into place. This album, like I like it was like those opening seven seconds, like you said, but like I immediately was kind of just put onto this album. And then I realized, Jesus, like this sounds like absolute. It, uh, it, it sounds like the fucking voice of God. It sounds like everything is just completely falling into place. And I think it's just maybe it was the backdrop of 2020 and everything was sad and miserable. And this was the perfect yeah. music that really kind of reflected like a loss. What, whether it be of innocence, of love, of anything you thought, like anything you held dear to you, it just felt like a loss of something. But at the same time, with everything, you know, in this album sounding so full and rich, you just felt like every emotion possible from, like, I finally understood what Brian Wilson was trying to say with every little bit of, like, you know, production. And I noticed everything, like, um, or not, I didn't notice everything, but I started noticing more and more things with each, whether it be the sounds of the bike horns or whether it be the bells or the theremins or whatever, there'd be a new favorite moment every time I listen to this record. And now in 2022, yeah, this album to me is just flawless, immaculate, masterful. Like, I feel like, again, like I hate to be the rock critic who says, oh yeah, like Pet Sounds is like absolutely just wonderful. One of the greatest works of all time. I Every time I listen to this, and I think also what, again, like um, you were saying, Jake, about um, how, like, uh, I think, uh, I don't know if you said it here, if it was in a DM or something like that, how it sounded like Cocteau Twins or something like that. I was getting into Cocteau Twins last year. I was getting more into Shoegaze. I was getting more into those sort of- And we really had the same of, year. And Pet Sounds really kind of was like the kick, like, like now it's like, yeah, like I, I just wasn't made for these times. Don't talk about my head on my shoulder. That's fucking dream pop. Mm -hmm. Pretty much everything you said about the, the themes of this album is why uh, the needle drop of God Only Knows in Boogie Nights is the single greatest needle drop in the history of film. Do, that, you're wrong if you disagree. Firstly, yes. thank you, good based day. and correct. Secondly, that leads me to God Only Knows, which like this isn't to like, oh. this isn't like a takey thing or anything, but like, this is the best song between both of these albums. And that's that's all my cards are on the table with that take. Sorry to anybody who disagrees, but get out of my life. One, one, um, little, one little bit of historical detail I want to throw in here. Uh, Wouldn't It Be Nice and God Only Knows were originally released on the same single. So God Only Knows was the B-side. That's the greatest to, single of all time. It is the highest rated single of all time on Rate Your Music. And I think... I mean, Yes, <laughs> I think I have that forty-five at home. I mean, That's, just it's oh, not. I it's not a, it, it, It's but well, it's not in packaging or anything because I got it off still. some guy. Some guy, but like probably doesn't even play. But it's, I mean, like that's the greatest song of all time and the second greatest <laughs> song of all time. <laughs> I mean, it's cheating almost. One. It feels it feels think? unfair in some respects, and like, you know, when when you say it's when you were getting into like, and I, I'm really bent on this Cocteau Twins comparison because it's like, I feel like everybody might have sort of a little bit of a journey with an album like this, just because like, when you start listening to music for the sound of it, that's when you really unlock the magic of this because this album is it's it's a you know. There's no feast or famine here. This is an this is a 
having its cake and eating it too kind of album where when you listen to it for the lyrics and like the very immediate musicality of all of it it's classic and tight and perfect and then when you listen to it for the raw sound of it and just like the emotional sort of tenor that the music gives off it, it it's also perfect it suits both functions and it suits both of them better than like most things do that are trying to do just one thing which is mind-blowing because it was the first thing to ever do anything like like that mm-hmm. how do you fucking how so, do you fucking do that <laughs> so um at this point i want to do something that um i, I want to introduce like an aspect of this that um i of course would want to talk about which is uh, and i know i'm not super expert on this so i can't really go into a lot of detail but i want to touch on music theory for just a little bit, minute here and one of the reasons why uh pet sounds is such a, a fucking like just jaw-dropping achievement is that so when you put a record on like this on when you listen to a song like wouldn't it be nice or god only knows you and you can inherently like connect with it like there's just something about those songs that feels both timeless that feels entrancing that feels different that feels just absolutely captivating and you can actually trace that through breaking down the musical approaches used to construct these songs Brian Wilson deliberately made harmonically complex arrangements. Not just that there's a lot of instrumentation in these songs, but the key that he's using is often, he'll often have really unusual sort of key choices and key changes. He will often resolve melodies in really unusual, but kind of quite potent ways that you didn't know you wanted. Very, very unconventional approach, just the structure of melody and stuff. And there's no more... You know, there's no better place of talking about unconventional musicality and how powerful it is than God only knows. Because the, the thing about the song who, from- who who thinks of the fucking where where like where does that come from? That's the most Brian Wilson shit anyone has ever done. His brain is so big. The, there's a whole section on the Wikipedia page for this song about the key ambiguity in this track. And what I mean by that is that no one is exactly sure what key this song is in, um, or at least certain parts of it anyway. And there is this key tonal ambiguity to the track. And that's why I think there's a lot of uh, discussion and debate about like the tone emotionally of the song as well, because Brian Wilson deliberately composes it in a way where there's no clear emotional signal like there is in a lot of pop music. And the, and he does this on a lot of songs on this record. He, he has these harmonic and he has these melodic and tonal and key choices that don't like, like when you think about like film scores or like conventional pop music, you have chords and you have melodies and you have keys that are chosen specifically. So the, the listener is absolutely clear how they're supposed to feel at a given point in time, right? It tells you, it tells your brain emotionally, you should feel this way. Whereas how Brian Wilson composes on this album is he deliberately does things that are unconventional in terms of music theory approach so that you're never quite certain of the emotional tone of a song you get a feeling uh, uh, but it's never like this incredibly strong vibrant feeling it's usually like a, a a mixed feeling or a moody feeling or or a troubled feeling and the beauty of the album is that even apart from music theory even down to the lyricism it's emotionally complex as well like you don't have songs like you think of classic beach boys before this you have like surfing usa and like all these like songs about like meeting a girl on the I beach like and doing a thing meeting a girl yeah. on the beach and driving around and it's like very two-dimensional stuff and it's musically beautiful um yeah. and i don't want to denigrate all of it because there is some really good music this wasn't like this was the first great album they made necessarily um but the thing is is that in the songwriting as well as in the musicianship there is this approach to make everything a little bit more complicated and that complexity that 
sense of interpretation is what makes so much of this music timeless, is one of the many things that makes so much of this music timeless. When you listen to God Only Knows, you cannot quite tell whether the narrator is actually genuinely suicidal and, and dwelling on, you know, his life without this person, or whether he's like, you know, euphoric. And, and there's, I don't think it's clearly either one of those two frames of mind, but it's somewhere between and you can't quite pin it down. And that's because of the way the song is written. And that's because of the way that the song is composed in terms of music theory. It has that classic sort of opening line that's kind of a fake out. I may not always love love you but long as there are stars above you you never need to doubt it where he the first line suggests that the love is impermanent and potentially fragile and then the next two lyrics completely contradict that and say like actually uh the love would only be impermanent in a world where there are no stars and that's like automatically from the start of the song lyrically you're being like um uprooted as a listener you're being like you know, fucked with as a listener because you're having a, a thought and then that thought's being twisted. And that's like a beautiful little tiny encapsulation of what this song is doing in so many different ways. Uh, and it's like, it's neither an optimistic or a pessimistic song, although it definitely has a streak of melancholy through it. If you should ever leave me, life would still go on. Believe me, like there's a kind of uh, acceptance there that's then undercut by the idea of the world can show nothing to me. So what good would living do me? Uh, I, my favorite sort of, um, or not favorite necessarily, because I do have a favorite on this album, but it's a bit more of a deep cut. But um, if you look back to Wouldn't It Be Nice, for instance, there's a similar, although I would argue more subtle and somewhat more devastating for me I don't know why a sense of this emotional complexity here because it's this real hope tinged with like a sense of clarity that it is just hope that it is just a wish and yet it doesn't like a lot of songwriters would paint that kind of hopefulness as tragic and I don't think Brian Wilson does but also I don't know that he does not do that it's just what makes this music so endlessly rewarding is you go back to it and you feel so many different things at once and it feels so true to the emotional experience of being in love of feeling for another person this again this really Top, this topic that used to be so two-dimensional that the Beatles and the Beach Boys wrote all their songs about is suddenly so much more complicated. And that to me is like what the, the genius of Brian Wilson's musicianship and songwriting here is that you never quite know how to feel, but you're always utterly taken with it. And um, I'll finish this little spiel and, and see back to you guys again by talking about my favorite song on this album. Uh, which is Don't Talk, Put Your Head on My Shoulders. Ah, great choice. Um, this song is... Now, every time I say this, it loses a little bit of power because I say it quite often. I can't listen to this song without crying. I just literally can't. This, to me, I think is... I don't know if I could say it's my favorite love song. I feel like I probably already said that about something else. But to me, it's the most like, it's the love song that makes me feel the most when I listen to it. There is this comfort, there is this pain, there is this genuine sense of love in it. And Brian's vocal performance is so tender. I think this is the only song on the album where he is the sole performer. Um, and it is so tender. It is so intimate. It's so beautiful. It's actually beautifully mirrored um, in feel and, and tone to me by a song on Revolver that I'll get to actually when we do that discussion too, mm. um, that op op occupies a similar sort of space on that album. But here it's like, not only is it, it's this song of comfort again, but it's made more complicated by the fact that it's kind of dissonant. It's the, the chords that he uses and this, the way he sings is kind of like, uh, you know, like a, a, if a vinyl record is kind of like malfunctioning and sort of slowing down and sort of curdling and the music's kind of like becoming poisoned. Like there's not a lot of that in that song, in this song. There's a little feel of it. The way he sings, don't talk, put your head on my shoulder. That, that, that particular melodic kind of 
drift and slide and glide and the way that line his voice kind of moves around that it's kind of eerie it's kind of uh just off but it's also beautiful in the same sense and genuinely comforting it's not that i don't know how he does it in any other song that level of eeriness would undercut the sense of genuine comfort in the lyrics but it doesn't here it still feels genuinely comforting but it just also feels slightly unusual and that's an enigmatic thing that i can't even unpack more than that and and it just absolutely stops me in my tracks every time i listen to this record and it's one of the most uh unre i i, I can't f- it makes me like fall in love with like music and music composition and everything about music all over again and actually he does a similar trick again on the closing track of this record, Caroline No, which has a similar tonality to it. But look, I've rambled again. Uh, what are We've talked about the kind of two biggies on this record. What are some more of your guys' favorite sort of songs on this record or songs that jump out to you and songs that are special to you? And what is it about them that you love? I think inextricably, like, Brian Wilson's sort of attitude and this feeds into don't talk, which is a great example of this is that like the best way I can put the mentality of this overall record and Brian's sort of outlook that he distills into his music overall. It's that like, there is no one alive or dead who understands that love and joy are exhausting more than Brian Wilson does. And he's able to somehow distill that into his music and channel the inherent melancholy and impermanence of all fleeting good things into a less than 40 minute long pop album. So I think that, you know, maybe take a second bow to the king, all that shit. Um, Personally, one of my more deep cut favorites from the album, if you can even have one, is uh, I Just Wasn't Made for These Times, which I think capitalizes on the emotional ambiguity of the song of just like it's just a song that is literally about feeling displaced and you're never sure if the narrator is like you know kind of high on himself saying like oh i just wasn't made for these times like i'm better than it but also like maybe he's not maybe he's fully aware of what he's saying it's just like the the voice and with it's spoken with is ambiguous but also it all of the ways that it could be altered are definite and you understand that but it, it makes its various shades apparent to you in the same way that don't talk does or something like um a bit of a grow for me which was sloop john b which mm. is just inhumanly catchy like what the fuck did they put into this like they laced it with crack uh and it's like i mean it's just this like i have never like do you just remember when you were a kid and you just got dragged somewhere that you just did not want to fucking be this is a song about that it's just being dragged every somewhere that you just and you, and you just you just hate every stage of where you are and you're just like i just want to go home and play my game boy i just don't want to be here i just don't want to be here that's what that song is about and i'm like i have never related to such a specific feeling in my life it's also so fucking catchy mm. If I may, I'll bring up a track that you brought up, Riley. Caroline, no. Again, this is just the power of music and like the power of like where you are in your life can really kind of, and your taste and your interest can really reflect what you like. When I heard Pet Sounds for the first time, Caroline, no is my least favorite track. Now it's probably my favorite track and probably like top 20 songs ever recorded. Every time I hear those, those opening drum beats, like uh, those, like how it bounces off of the wall of sound, off of the proverbial wall of sound, or that's probably not the right word, but fuck it, I don't care. But like, it's just like, uh, and then it just goes into Brian Wilson. I remember Tony Asher's like kind of, uh, the the man who helped write all the lyrics. Mm-hmm. I remember him saying that he thought Caroline no, the Caroline in the song was not just a girl that Brian had known when he was younger and like had realized that like, you know, they're older and their lives are different and he'll never be able to see her the same way again. But it may be Brian himself about how like uh, he, and that may be the definitive thesis statement for Pet Sounds, how at one point, he was a much happier person. And Pet Sounds 
was his kind of way of saying, no, I'm not this happier person. Like the Serpent USA guy, that's, that's not me anymore. Like uh, my, my long hair is gone. My happiness is completely gone. I can't get it back. And to me, it is one of the most beautiful statements in all of pop music. Mm. The way that the way that melody kind of comes back through the instrumentation, his gorgeous, gorgeous fucking falsetto. All of that is just beautifully, beautifully done in like a fucking two and a half minute song. It's one of the most gorgeous things. Like I remember listen, I remember there was a day I was listening to it like 10 times in a row, just crying all the way through. Mm. Whew, it's, a, it's a heavy, heavy emotional song. And I said this on Twitter. I'll say it again. The French horn and God only knows is my favorite <sighs> fucking thing ever committed to music. Jeez. And, and, I... the in- and the instrumentals on this fucking let's go away for a while. Just like that may be the album's most peaceful, most uh, clear moment of serenity. Oh man. What's interesting about let's go away for a while as well. And Pet Sounds, the title track. Both these are the two instrumentals on the album. What's interesting about them is that they were actually ori- originally written and recorded with lyrics as typical songs. But Brian decided to leave the lyrics off and to take the vocal tracks off because he felt that the instrumentals worked better on their own and, and didn't need a lyrical um, layer added to them. And it's also worth noting that um, he Brian Wilson is called Let's Go Away for a While, his favorite instrumental that he's ever composed. And it's I I've always I think as when I was younger, I kind of overlooked these little instrumental moments. I kind of thought they were pretty a bit insubstantive. But no, the more that I've grown with this album, the more that they've just genuinely had this profound emotional effect on me. Uh, and I think that um, that track in particular, Let's Go Away for a While, especially coming in the context of the album where it does after these kind of like slightly melancholic uh, well not even slightly melancholic there's some some genuinely melancholic stuff in between that's not me and I'm waiting for the day and then to have this sort of contemplative moment uh, it, it's it's gorgeously sad and pretty and again like emotionally complex as well like um, one of the things I love about Brian Wilson as a songwriter is not just that he writes emotionally complex songs sometimes the the emotion is not ambiguous at all. Like with Caroline, no, that's just straight up a, a, a fucking incredibly sad song. Um, but he he recognizes that even sadness itself is complex, is not two dimensional, is a difficult thing to actually convey in a way that really connects with people. And it is often conveyed two dimensionally in music. And those lyrics in Caroline know, like, the things that, how could I ever find in you again? The things that made me love you so much then. Like, that's, you know, on the surface is this, like, you know, straightforward lyric about, like, you know, falling out of love and losing, you know, no longer feeling a connection to someone. But if you really, like, interrogate and think about that sentiment in a way that I think Brian encourages you to do, like, there's so much more beneath the surface of that there's the implications there of like you know uh, your emotional relationship to the people around you to the art that you make and to the world itself is like I mean it's it's devastating and like it's the root of his depression right there in a song and shit man it's just it's a lot yeah Yeah, if if I can speak to anything here that's maybe like if I can, an unpopular th- thing is that I'll, I'll try and put on my critic hat just a tiny little bit here because I, 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 I do have tiny itty bitty reservations about the album. And I feel like if we were just here, you know, slobbering all over it the whole time, we wouldn't be speaking to the entirety of the experience because I still think this is one of the best albums ever made. And I still think it's near perfect. And I love all of it, even in the lesser moments, which the instrumentals, I love them. I think they're great. I inherently do not enjoy them as much as the the tracks with vocals, just because I feel like on an album like this, I almost can't. Uh, and maybe that's more of a problem with me than it is with the album, but inherently I am simply more into and engaged with that. Specifically, I, I think Let's Go Away for a while, I think it's the stronger one because of its place. Um, Pet Sounds, I think is like as good instrumentally, but I am, you know, 
frankly, I, I like it. It works. It's fine. But I'll take or leave its placement on the album. I, 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 I mean, like, it should be placed on the album. But its placement there on the album, I'll take or leave. Also, the, the, the only proper song on here that I would, like, say that I really, really like a little bit more in theory, I guess, than in practice would be That's Not Me, which is really effectively demonstrating a moment of almost dissociation. And on the one hand, I kind of like that it just sort of fades out and ends because it really sort of puts on the, it sort of lays on thick the, the, the serendipitousness of that moment and the, 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 the melancholy and how it just kind of disappears. But at the cost of sounding like a less substantial song, the fade out on it lasts for a really long time too. So I feel like, I don't know, maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit more there. But again, these are songs that I capital L love and I only have these problems with them because I've listened to this album a lot in the last two years a lot in the last two years so there's that for anybody who might you know who might accuse us too much of sucking Brian Wilson's dick which I'm still gonna do anyway because you can't fucking stop me present it Brian one song I want to shout out that we haven't mentioned yet uh that has one of my most one of my favorite sort of choruses uh, in terms of like melodic construction and just hugeness is I know there's an answer, oh, there's an answer. which my yeah. second favorite of the album well actually M- Morgan I want why don't you talk about this song then what is it what do you love about this song well it's it uniformly on this album it really is just the sound of it I've heard so many of these songs just just through cultural osmosis a lot and I know a lot of them pretty well uh, I know there's an answer was one that didn't necessarily ring too many bells when I first listened to this and maybe a bit of that is what's getting me so far with this one in particular is just that it's new to me but there's there's so much of Brian Wilson's journey I think in this song in particular even on a sort of metatextual level of not just struggling with how he sees the world, but struggling to make this album as good as it can be. It's the perennial search for something better. I think far and away, my favorite U2 song, I still haven't found what I'm looking for, uh, does this better than most songs ever have. It's just confidence that the thing that makes everything right is out there but that you may not be able to find it anytime soon and it's also just one of my favorite instrumentals on the album Mm. that's a just perfect microcosm of the album it's just the title i know there's an answer that's you know you know it's there but you don't know what it is the um, fucking genius the chorus (laughs) the chorus melody on this song is one of my favorite vocal melodies on the whole. The, just the way he goes, I know now, but I have to find and Then the drum it hits at the end that just sounds so distant, but they sound loud as fuck. Yeah. And, and, that and saxophone. Who doesn't love a saxophone? Oh, I mean, there's like so, many, so much instrumentation on here that we literally just don't have the time to talk about all the instrumentation on this album. But there's actually, within this song, a really good segue into our Revolver discussion, which is that this song, I Know There's an Answer, was uh, originally one of its intended, like, it was originally written differently, and it was originally quite explicitly a song about Brian Wilson's experiences with LSD, um, before he rewrote it to be slightly more enigmatic and have slightly more meaning to it than it originally did. And so the influence <laughs> of Brian Wilson's ex- experiences with LSD can be felt throughout this record. He's clearly said it's not a psychedelic record, but it has psychedelic touches and moments within a lot of the songs, which I think would be a fair way of describing it. And so Wilson's experience with LSD heavily informed not just like his creative expression and songwriting, but also, of, of course, the colorful and, and dense sound of the record. And experiences with LSD were not limited to Mr. Wilson at this particular time in history among the musical greats. At this same time, Mr. John Lennon, Paul McCartney, uh, George Harrison, and Ringo Starr were getting really into LSD. 
to the point where the ways in which their albums at this time are thought of kind of overshadows or kind of like re reduces or kind of makes you think about the albums in ways that are slightly more restrictive than how they actually are. Like people think of Revolver and uh, Sgt. Peppers as like LSD albums. Um, but like, yeah, they may have been using LSD around the time they were writing them, but that's not necessarily, maybe is, maybe isn't one of the key kind of creative influences, but nevertheless, it's a thread that connects these two albums. I mean, admittedly, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Which I believe it was not intended to reference LSD, but I think that could be- Horseshit. Could be bullshit. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah. And it's not just about the drug. What, what it is, is it's about what the drug represents and, ter and particularly in terms of the counterculture wave of the 60s and how it was accelerating around this time to its kind of peak in 68 and 69. But in 66, LSD was all the rage and the Beatles were experimenting with LSD. They were experimenting, they were becoming sort of more accustomed with non-Western philosophies as well in ways which would admittedly become more pronounced on later records than this one. Uh, I think their famous trip to India was um, around the time of the White Album, so a little bit later than this. But um, this was still a period where the Beatles were, again, as I kind of mentioned at the beginning of this episode, both of these bands were expanding their influence and range beyond just what was currently popular where they were based. They were looking outward a little bit more. And so if Pet Sounds is an album of songs that represent the uh, infinite possibilities of studio production and sound, then Revolver is a record which also represents that in its own different ways, but also represents specifically a vision of the future for rock music and pop music and the relationship between the two. Um, it's very much a clear precursor for the Velvet Underground and Nico, which would come the very next year, which would take a lot of what the foundation that's established on Revolver and turn the dial up and break the dial and then throw the dial through a window. But Revolver still is the ground zero. And Revolver's relationship to Pet Sounds is one that when you listen to the two records off the cuff, you might not immediately be able to see. I believe it goes beyond just the swapping of influences between these two bands to represent entirely different things that tell you about what the cutting edge of music was in 1966 and how that was manifesting. So for Brian Wilson, it was... Let's create these lush, ornate arrangements that have as much instrumentation as possible at the same time that layer all of this instrumentation in this unprecedented way to make it all sound clear and vibrant and huge. And that has these melodically really complicated musical arrangements that are emotionally sophisticated and draped in this broad concept as well. Revolver, on the other hand, is less tactful it's less tasteful it is more in many ways more ugly more um just serrated and edgy i mean you put this album on and you hear the opening guitar on tax man and automatically that's more distorted and more kind of atonal than any guitar that you can hear in a beatles song prior to this quite distinctly I think Harrison's playing in general on this record is very uh shocking I could Im only imagine listening to this album at the time a lot of Beatles fans jumped off ship completely at this point in time and the Beatles were very frank about saying well if you're not into this then see ya you didn't watch in the first place yeah and, and and Paul and John in particular were very adamant about that um you have very innovative techniques that are innovative in a different way so with pet sounds it's all about what can we bring into the studio and what can we uh what instrumentation can we add and how can we kind of layer it to create something I think we new. can get a horse in here whereas with um 
revolver it's not just about what how can we layer music and what we do it's about how can we record this to make it sound truly fucking out there how can we incorporate a lot of what's happening in avant-garde scenes at the time you're talking about the influence of like burgeoning avant-garde scenes and artists like andy warhol and all that sort of thing that would again come to the full with velvet underground how can we take the avant-garde and infuse it into what we're doing how can we take what can we do to record our music differently to make our music sound so much more uncomfortable and uncompromising how can we take these songs that we're writing that are and that are also it has to be said getting more uh musically complex as well and how can we actually push forward the sound of rock music and the answer is revolver it is an absolutely airtight fist punch of an album it is just 100% determined to just fuck you up when you listen to it within, you know, the realm of this particular kind of music anyway. And so, yeah, let's sort of, again, like with Pet Sound, I want to hear about each of your experiences with this album, how long it's been in your life, whether your relationship with it has changed, how you feel about it in relation to the Beatles' other work. Um, Yeah, who wants to lead off? Well, I've said before that Revolver is my favorite album by this particular band, and I don't really see that changing, frankly. Um, this has just been such a staple of my music listening life that I, you know, I've heard this album before I listen to albums. So, you know, in many ways, it's difficult to evaluate. But I mean, the cool thing about Revolver is that it's just so very evidently on its face innovative that, like, coming back to it is knowing it's just like oh it's just all these Beatles songs and then I come back to it and I'm just like god looking at it from this perspective this was such a fucking moment you have a I mean there's a great fucking case to be made that the 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 ground zero for all of this really wasn't necessarily LSD uh, or anything but really the ground zero for it was the Beatles meeting Bob Dylan who gave them weed and then they got into LSD after that after a rubber, rubber soul and frankly I think their attempts to sort of you know the, Harrison and Lennon specifically were like you know he was their idol and so I think after that it was sort of their goal to kind of adopt that spirit and immediately they want to marry that with pop sensibilities, which I think is perfectly realized on the opening song, Taxed Man, which I mean, for, first of all, flat fucking banger. Uh, George Harrison in the middle of the song just goes fucking stupid in the middle of it. I also just, I love how this song is written because it's frankly just kind of fucking hysterical. It gets you cold, I'll tax the heat, go on the, uh, I'll tax your feet. Fucking like the, the, the rhymes are just so clever and the melody is just so tight. And I, I, I'm, I'm a really big fan of the way that the, the sort of irreverent songwriting on here that's also just kind of entrenched in like genuine anxiety and like it's, it's elsewhere on the album too. But I think that's like the, the sort of God only knows moment for this album, I think is indisputably Eleanor Rigby, which is cliche, still probably my favorite song on here because I mean, this is a song that doesn't even have any like drums and shit in it. It just comes in and it's just strings and vocals and you're just like, oh man, pop music can be sad. But I mean, like, it's not just that it can be sad. It's just that like within a three minute long span, they are able to capture, I mean, like that fucking vocal refrain. Oh, look at all the lonely people. Where do they all come from? The Everything here feels very elemental, but it's all in service of something. Each song just makes me feel such a specific emotion, kind of say, in the same way that Pet Sounds does, but Pet Sounds is more about unity, whereas this is more of a everything in the kitchen sink kind of album. It's a perfect album cover to represent it. And you have Eleanor Rigby, which is just a fucking like, I, I mean, like to say it's sad just kind of does it justice. It's just like, I can't imagine what people who follow the Beatles for pop music were thinking when they suddenly come along the song it's just like here's a song about a woman who dies alone and a priest who buries her at a funeral that nobody comes to it's just like well that's certainly something and it's, it's that, not just like the beer string arrangement as well it's how like jagged the strings sound how like urgent and kind of like intense it is like it's like it's like they're trying to fucking take the Bernard Herrmann psycho score and turn it into a <laughs> pop song 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and sh completely and change the emotional tonality of it. I mean, which is all over this. I mean, like, think about something like the, the, the I'm jumping the gun a little bit here, but like the tape effects that are on songs like Tomorrow Never Knows, which I mean, again, no wonder people jumped off ship with the Beatles when they heard a song like this. This for now, if you put this exact song on an album that came like, th this would be something that would be on like the new Black Midi album or something like somebody expecting something weird and avant and whatever. But the, there's a core rhythm and melody to this that feels like encompassing that's rooted you in it. And then the atmosphere of that kind of tape effect, it just kind of sizzles and eats itself. And it sounds fucking awesome. And that is to say, there are so many great deep cut moments on this album that people take for granted. One of my favorite Beatles songs ever for no one, which I think is exactly as melancholic as something like Eleanor Rigby in a completely different way. I mean, it just goes to show you how great these, you know, <laughs> three of the greatest songwriters of all time, all respect to Mr. Uh, Richard Starkey. Um, but you had George Harrison, John Lennon, and Paul McCartney. And you can, you can tell pretty much who wrote each one of these, but it's excellent for the various ways that they are excellent. But I mean, even then, you know, you've got moments that are infinitely classic, like uh, Yellow Submarine, which is my least favorite song on the album. I, I love it. It's a classic song, but I just like the other songs more. Please don't kill me, Beatles fans. I love you. I love the song. Just well, you can. I, I just you can kill me because it's piss. I'll fucking I'll piss on you. No way. It's called do it. Sub I'll come yes. over to your house. I'll do it. <laughs> Drive the three <laughs> hours, bitch. Yeah, they should have right, called. Right. should have called it Golden Submarine. Um, all right, August. All right. Um, point is i love this album and i love like it's innovative and it's weird and wiry and 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 all of those other things but i also just like it because it displays that elemental simplicity that all beatles that all great beatles music has is that at the core of all of this is that you have some of the best musicians to you know be accepted into the canon of popular music doing some of the weirdest shit they would ever do and it never kind of eclipses that it's always enough that is like you know it, it's not like you know the white album where you know they they kind of go far too far in a few places here it's always something that you can understand and latch onto, and it's communicated but it's done in a way that you've never heard before and that bands still to this day don't attempt to do shit this wacky on albums that they've made so well fuck yeah our, to our guest jacob again as with pet sounds i'd love to hear your experience with this album you said you're big into the beatles when you were younger your experience mm -hmm. with this record um and how you feel about it now so, oh boy, like um, when it comes to the Beatles, I like they were my favorite band in middle school, and then uh, come high school, I I still love them just as much. I I hadn't listened to Revolver in a very long time. I had preferred other albums that they had done. I preferred Rubber Soul. I preferred A Hard Day's Night. I preferred Abbey Road, White Album, Sgt. Pepper's, and so it was kind of a culture shock to like really listen to it again and to hear like because I knew how the album started with Tax Man the album's title really kind of like solidifies it it sounds like a gun like again like it sounds much noisier than Rubber Soul and it doesn't have that same kind of you know psychedelic uh, blissfulness of like a Sgt. Pepper's or a Magical Mystery Tour and so re-listening to this again again, like for the first time since like high school all the way through, it really kind of came back to mind again, how heavy and even angry, like Tax Man is an angry song. It's all mm -hmm. about like, why the fuck am I getting taxed? And yet like that fucking like harsh ass Put soul. pennies on your eyes if you die so I could come take your money, bitch. Literally the last <laughs> lyric of the song. <laughs> I, I don't think he says pitch, but <laughs> to me, like um, a couple of the album's crowning moments, and your bird can sing. Yes, fucking yes. gorgeous Based. song. Love like, that and track. like that guitar line is perfect. In some ways, like in terms of who would be like the main star of this album, my favorite Paul song is on this record, which means it's one of my favorite songs of all time because it's the Beatles. Oh. Maybe got to get you into my life. 
Ooh, good choice. Ooh, I like that. Deep cut it's, pick. Love those See, horns. I'm, baby. Those horns are amazing. And look, I'm a suck. Look, I'm to me, like having this album end on Got to Get You Into My Life and Tomorrow Never Knows really kind of shows both Paul and John's personal philosophies when it comes to songwriting and when it comes to pot. Because Got to Get You Into My Life is very much a pot song. It's yeah. about like how much Paul loved smoking weed and like oh like I'm so in love with you girl and then again you go to you know far later into Paul's career with the wings you know his biggest hit was silly love songs meanwhile John like he was writing about how weed and LSD and all of these different drugs were expanding his mind and then you go back to like you know his career and like you know it would be trying to like you know explore the different philosophies of human nature, of life, about pain and all of that stuff. Meanwhile, Paul is just like, yeah, like, I love you. And I think that's kind of a beautiful thing to just kind of end the album on those two tracks. Well, and then Paul, of course- Paul is like that, um, that clip from SpongeBob of Patrick when, when they're like selling chocolate and the dude opens the door and he's just like, I love you. Not to get my you favorite. into my life has those guitar licks in the middle, like, like Harrison was going stupid on this album. Stupid. And kind of, he's the secret MVP of this record because I yes. remember an old quote from yes. Quincy Jones. Like apparently, like I remember people were calling Quincy Jones stupid for this, but like he called like the Beatles the worst musicians in the world when he met them. But it was like 1963, yes. and they hadn't really developed as players yet. George, like this was kind of like his moment where he was like, "All right, we're gonna like." really crank it with these solos and with these riffs and as much as i again enjoy highlights off of this record it's still not one of my personal favorite beatles albums it's great and i think part of it i i think part of it is also the fact that part of the whiplash of this album comes from listening to sergeant pepper's listening to Abbey Road, listening to the White Album, and hearing those crisp Giles Martin mixes, and then kind yeah. of going back to the digital versions of, like, I don't have the CD, I don't have the vinyl, I haven't had a CD player in years, I finally yeah. just... I, I have the like, vinyl and the CD mix, so I get to hear it in the way that it's, you know, meant to be heard, but even then, we don't have a proper remastering of this album, and we need it. Giles Martin it. said rubber soul and revolver mixes are coming. We don't know when, Thank but they are coming. God. That's good. Yes. So glad. Hook them long so, I think, but again, part of that is not the album's fault, but I just wish that, yeah, like it came sooner rather than later because I feel so, like, and again, mm. like I'll look up like CD mixes and stuff like that because again, like re-listening to this album again was a huge treat and Mm -hmm. You know, again, like she said, she said, good day, sunshine. And Dr. Robert, especially, I love the fact that it's fucking about Bob Dylan himself. At least I think it is. <laughs> like, I know there's probably. A rumor. Uh, I, I, mm -hmm. It's not one of my absolute favorites on the record, but I would say Dr. Robert might be the most, actually, no, the most underrated song on uh, Revolver is Love You Too. Love You Too. Yeah. Uh -huh. but, oh, that's but, good. But Dr. Great Robert song. is really underrated too. Um, Love You Too is like, it's fucking nuts when you think about it as a Beatles song yeah. at this point in time. It's this sitar-led song. It has this kind of like, I don't know if it's, I guess it's the bass. I'm not sure if it's the bass with the guitar, but it's being played like a fucking, it has this kind of grunting tonality to it. And and the and it's just like the whole sound of it is just un, out of this fucking world. But yeah, I have a lot to say on the sound of the album, but I want to save that because Jacob, you've talked about how you have some sort of reservations about this record in terms of like upper echelons of Beatles albums. Morgan, I know you're not huge on this album. So I think this might be the right point in the discussion for you to jump in and talk about what, how you feel about this album, what your experiences have been with it. Why over it's the years, shite. Why you feel the way you do. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> here's the deal i've been putting off listening to so many of these classic beatles records in full for most of my life at this point 
to avoid this exact conversation. Um, <laughs> so, you know, here we are. It feels fucking stupid to say out loud that the Beatles are kind of hit and miss for me, but they are. And here, this is this is all I have. Um, I'm, I, it's 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 in it's in this segment wherein I will try to strike a balance between the opinion that everybody else has and the super obnoxious like fucking Reddit 4chan posters like the Beatles are gay like <laughs> yes which, which chad yes that's all oh, well yeah. and good that's fun um <laughs> i laugh but i'm i'm trying to think about this semi critically and uh, so i'm going to avoid the impulses in me to be like what the fuck are you people talking about right now you know when talking about fucking yellow submarine or you know the damn uh you know to what to what you know That's fucking dr robert or whatever if it makes like, you feel what? better morgan yellow submarine's also my least favorite on the album um i i let let's just get that out of the way right now that song sucks shit uh, <laughs> especially in comparison to fucking pet sounds it sounds like some wet limp dick attempt at like an earlier beach boys song and it just completely falls flat. It falls flat because everyone f- sounds like they're asleep at the wheel. What is going on with you people? You can add a little bit of vocal verve to this instead of. In the time I was born, I was born. <laughs> Tell me he doesn't fucking sound like that. Tell me he doesn't. Look, Ringo. I don't. That's it. That's it, Ringo. <laughs> I don't like Ringo's voice as a singer very much. I never really have. Um, I think there are times where he uses it well, like on um, Octopus's Garden and uh, oh, fucking a better Ringo song, frankly, and fucking with a little help from my friends as well. Like he he knows how he, he knows the one. he knows the vocal limitations he has, and he kind of uses them wisely there. He is the reason that Yellow Submarine is Miley's favorite song on Revolver. I think there's a lot going on in that song that I do enjoy. I think there's a lot of kooky, crazy, fun musical instrumentation. I understand why people find it obnoxious. Anyway. A lot of the sound of this record in particular just doesn't do very much for me. It sounds like it's in like a sort of weird state of flux between something like Sgt. Pepper's and River Soul, but to me that's kind of a detriment just because it doesn't really perfect either sound, and that's a pretty pervasive complaint throughout most things here, except for uh, Eleanor Rigby and uh, my favorite song on the record, uh, Tomorrow Never Knows, uh, which is just fucking whack, and I dig that's a, that's a complaint I didn't see myself having with this record is that it's not weird enough for me most of the time uh, because the the part of the Beatles career that I tend to enjoy most is the rubber soul era where they're just perfecting traditional pop music as we know it instead of this really sort of psychedelic experimental phase. Come at me in the comments, I guess. We talked briefly before we, there was a brief discussion of the MVP of this record and undeniably like Harrison is deserving of all the love in the world and his guitar parts on this record are stunning. Uh, my pick for the MVP on this record is actually George Martin because a lot of the way this record sounds and a lot of why I love the record and I, I think equally probably a lot of why Morgan dislikes the record because like I think a fair way of, I can understand if this record is kind of like it relies too much on the experimentation and how extreme it is. And, and I can understand that perspective as well. Like when it's just like, it's just not quite refined in the way that the records after it and before it are. But that is one aspect of the record that I do quite love. And, and the reason why I love it is because of George Martin, because of what he's able to do on this album. And the Beatles have specifically spoken about how this record wouldn't exist in the form it d- does if it weren't for George Martin, because he was the person who was able to realize their grand visions in the studio for how they wanted things to sound when they had ideas about 
different ways to layer a track or new sounds to incorporate or tape loops or whatever. George was the person who made that happen. And so this was really the point of the career where George, George's involvement in the band and his role as their producer became more it became less sort of standard and more kind of complicated in the sense that he became more involved compositionally here. It sort of started with Rubber Soul where he was kind of, that was where they were really pushing at the studio boundaries of, of how their records could sound. But here was a quantum leap and a big part of that was Martin becoming more involved in composition and song construction. The tape loop stuff, we've already obviously talked about it in terms of Tom Tomorrow Never Knows. It is incredible in that song. It's the it utterly feels like it's swallowing the song whole. Uh, one of my favorite little bits of bizarre decision making on this album is in the song I'm Only Sleeping, where you have a Harrison guitar solo that's played backwards and just kind of like garbled. And, and it sounds like this record, even though like you associate it with like the vinyl era, to me, it sounds like a cassette tape kind of unspooling inside of a stereo and kind of just coming to pieces, essentially. Like, this is such a cassette album for me. I don't really know why. It's just, it has that kind of feel. Maybe it's something to do with, like, the, the sound design and stuff. But, or maybe it's just the fact that you have so many tape loops on it that are obviously cassette recordings. But anyway, um, his role on this album is super, super important. And I feel like shouldn't be understated. Uh, but also, another thing I love is just how many timeless little guitar parts are on this album. Um, you have... Uh, the little kind of intro to I Want to Tell You, which is another song I think is super underrated on this album. I love the little kind of catchy melodic motifs in this song. You have my favorite song on this record, She Said, She Said, which is a top 10 Beatles song, in my opinion. The guitar line here, the guitar part is just so fucking iconic to me. Like it's just always gets in my head and it makes me feel like a certain way that very few Beatles songs make me feel and also I love like the juxtaposition between how sunny this song sounds it's so bright and kind of burvy and major key and that guitar line is so like uh sun drenched and like Rolling Stones-esque and then you have this lyrical refrain of she said I know what it's like to be dead which is like a really eerie and unsettling lyric as, as hard as hell, right? Like it's like, oh shit. And and that, that little wig juxtaposition is so awesome. Um, but yeah, I just think that's a perfect song. Another song I want to shout out as well. And I referenced uh, when I talked about, um, when we were talking about pet sounds and I brought up uh, Don't Talk But Your Head On My Shoulders as this sort of quieter moment of tenderness and sort of stripped back on an album that is so like, intense in terms of like sound design and wall of sound all that sort of stuff and the counterpoint the counterpart rather to that on this record is here there and everywhere which is probably my second favorite song on this album a beautiful beautiful little mccartney love ballad it is just soft and genuine and like so kind of emotional and there is Yet also there's some real sort of harmonic innovation here. There's some real sort of unconventional melodic progressions and chord changes and sequences. It is, um, it is the, the writing of this song has actually been linked to the influence of Brian Wilson on Paul McCartney's songwriting style. I think McCartney in particular was the Beatle who was most clearly influenced by Brian Wilson and has had over the many, many years since these two bands were at their peak McCartney has said so many gushed so much about Brian Wilson as his like favorite musician of that era and so I think if you're to look for that influence then you can see it here on a song like here there and everywhere and Revolver came out what three four months after Pet Sounds I am sure that there were singles as well that preceded Pet Sounds that will have influenced the writing of this album so we, we're talking about these albums together because they innovated pop music and rock music at a particular time, but they also had a profound effect on each other. And the way they think that we feel about each of these records is also like not, and not hugely, but at least partly dictated by the other album, by the fact that we are comparing these two albums. I think that only intensifies the way that we feel about each of them. 
or they're more shocking for what they are when you compare them to the other album. And that juxtaposition, the reason we're doing this video to really impress this, the reason we're doing this video, the reason we're talking about these albums together is to really get everyone in a state of mind where it's the summer of 1966 and these are the two records dominating the airwaves to get you back in the, into the headspace of a time where you were hearing these two things together where you had pet sounds and then you had revolver and they were both contextualized by each other in ways that maybe neither artist could have predicted and so whether you feel a preference for one record or whether you feel a preference for another the, the symbiotic relationship of these two albums is super, super important to appreciate. And I think can't be divorced from talking about the songs and the sound themselves. And yeah, that's why I think these are, it's so important that we're doing this. Yeah. You mentioned this, like um, how these albums kind of came out three months from each other. I also think of, you know, what the Beatles were influenced by as well, like with the avant-garde scene, and yet Pet sounds so, sounds so deeply ingrained in the summer of love. Whereas Revolver, it was more influenced by the experimental art scene that was happening around the time, you know, George was expanding his music tastes. Lennon was starting to act in more films. Like they had made films themselves and were, and you know, Paul McCartney met Antonioni and like uh, they were influenced by that scene at the time. If Pet Sounds is the summer of love and like kind of represents the, even as sad as it is, represents maybe the happier, more nostalgic times of it, then Revolver is also every, all the happier sides of it stripped away, the violence of it all as well. Again, it's the title of the album, Revolver. Yeah, exactly right. Like pet sounds, something like kind of comforting and like like an embrace versus revolver, like a literal kind of bullet to the fucking head. No John Woo reference intended, although fucking why not? So that's the, the duality and the dynamic of these two albums, I think. And I hope it's clear to everyone listening why we discuss them together, because I think that each makes the other stronger as well and gives you more to appreciate about this amazing time in music history when the possibilities of what you could do was just exploding. Favorite tracks and ratings then for Revolver. Jake, what are your favorite tracks and ratings? Uh, Revolver, my favorite tracks, my favorite would be Got to Get You Into My Life. Oh God, oh, uh, Tomorrow Never Knows. And um, Tax Man. And my rating would be an 8.5 out of 10. All righty. Um, Morgan. Uh, my favorite tracks are Tomorrow Never Knows, Eleanor Rigby, and For No One. And my least favorite is, yeah, Yellow Submarine. And I will give this a 5.5 out of 10. All righty. Um, mine are... She Said, She Said, uh, Here, There, and Everywhere, and Tomorrow Never Knows. Least favorite, Yellow Submarine. I give the album an 8.5 as well. Jake? Revolver. My favorite songs are Eleanor Rigby, Tomorrow Never Knows, and uh, For No One. Least favorite song is Yellow Submarine. Album gets a 9 out of 10. All right. And favorite tracks and ratings for Pit Sounds. That's the one. Uh, J Jacob uh, favorite tracks off of Pet Sounds my favorite is Caroline No and then God Only Knows and then um, oh god uh, don't talk with your head on my shoulder That's a, and then uh, my least favorite none 10 out of 10 Morgan uh, my favorite tracks are uh, God only knows. Uh, I know there's an answer, and wouldn't it be nice? Uh, again, no least favorite. Uh, team. My uh, favorite tracks are Don't Talk, Put Your Head on My Shoulders, Wouldn't It Be Nice, and I will say. Um, yeah, I mean, it's God, God Only Knows, but I was going to say, like, with that one accepted, but, I mean, it's God Only Knows. 
least favorite track get out of my house <laughs> um it's a 10 out of 10 for me three favorite songs are god only knows um wouldn't it be nice and probably don't talk put your head on my shoulder least favorite song is probably the title track pet sounds and i give it a 9.5 out of 10 i sick almost a clean sweep and so last question to ask and answer then is and i think this this will be pretty clear for most of us which one do we prefer then out of pet sounds and revolver I obviously love both albums, so this is a very difficult comparison to make between the two of them. And I obviously have a very deep, very long running attachment to Revolver. It's the Beatles were my first band that I ever got into. And that was the album of theirs that I had gravitated towards and still gravitate towards the most. It has some of their most interesting ideas and some of their most basic uh, classic rock shit that is just so enjoyable, so nostalgic, so warm to me that like this is both comfortable and it is so forward thinking and innovative that I'm constantly in awe of it. And Pet Sounds is the better album. It just is, uh, in my opinion. It's, it's, it's a slim margin by which I would dictate the quality, but the, the holistic nature of that record, the sound of that record, the emotional tone of that album, that is what I value so much about music. And it inexorably is going to lead to me preferring it, even though I do have my minor nitpicks with both. They're all still front to back enjoyable listens, but if I had to save one and my house was on fire, I'm saving pet sounds. Sorry, John Paul, Ringo, George, Team Brian. I think it's a universal <laughs> pet sounds all around then. I think everyone universally prefers pet sounds, which is really interesting and maybe says Sorry. something about uh, each of us as people, or maybe it doesn't. Who fucking knows? Uh, so that gives us a 7.9 average for Revolver and a 9.9 .9 average for pet sounds. <laughs> <laughs> Which is yes, uh, right. nuts. That's just, is that just the as, highest you've ever gone? No, we've like given we've we've given fucking ten point our averages before. Don't worry, we did that. Just the one. Well, the one with all of us, yeah, which was Dead Wing. But also when it was me, Jake, and Morgan, we gave a ten point to Aviary by Julia Holter, um, as well. And Jake and I just together gave a ten point to both Burial's Tunes and Sophie's Oil of Every Pearl is on inside. So depending oh, on yeah. how much weight you give them, depending on how many people are rating, we well, yes, we have done that before, but Deadwing is kind of the king. Porcupine Tree's Deadwing, because all five of us at the time uh, gave that a 10. But yeah, so there goes, the, that's the end of the debate then. It's pet sounds, fuck off, I'm just kidding. It's, um, it's, it's a complicated question with many moving parts. Let us know at home what you think of the Pet Sounds versus Revolver debate. What do you think of these two albums in relation to each other? Which album means the most to you? Or do you think the whole question is stupid and that they should just be considered equals? Whatever your position is, please let us know in the comments below. We want to be able to have a discussion with you guys as viewers about this topic. And so if you leave a comment, we will be sure to check it out and reply. So please do that if you're interested. If you've enjoyed the discussion, then please also consider giving the video a like as well. That really helps us a lot. If you enjoy what we do, if you want to see more from us, make sure you hit the subscribe button if you have not already. We do three videos a week on Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday. And um, if you want to go the extra mile to support us, if you really like what we do, you can also hit the join button. And for just a dollar a month, you can support us in exchange for getting priority responses with any questions or recommendations that you have, as well as a shout out by name in the intro for every video that we put on this channel. So if that sounds like something that appeals to you and you want to support us, then we'd be uh, forever grateful. But yeah, in the meantime, look forward to hearing from you all. Stick around for next week where we have a different new special guest and we're going to be reviewing the new albums from um, Earl Sweatshirt and FKA Twigs plus our next week's record club, which I believe is going to be my record club on the progressive metal slash art rock opus from Mordland of the Well, Bath slash Leaving Your Body Map. 
Uh, in two days' time on this channel, there will also be a video up where Zach and I have a discussion about the new Sean Baker movie, Red Rocket. Really looking Ooh. forward to you guys seeing that. That was a really interesting discussion that we had, and we touched on a lot of really interesting things. So check that out. Uh, more film and musical content coming very soon, of course, and make sure you're subscribed. As always, though, rock over London, rock on Chicago, Disneyland, the happiest place on earth.